All right, everyone. So I want to talk to you guys about revolution. This is a topic that I have been talking about for uh, a number of years now, actually for <laughs> a very long time. Um, one of my first books talked a lot about the dangers of revolutionaries and revolutions, and that book was written back in 2010. So yeah, I've been talking about this subject for over a decade. Um, and there is a lot of talk about revolution and, uh, you know, overthrowing the system and overthrowing the elites and, you know, killing the rich and taking their money and redistributing it to the poor and to the working class and to the, uh, the proletariat because they're the ones who own all of the property. They're the ones who own all the land because, as Che Guevara himself said, the one who works the land is the one who owns it. So, in the... Uh, socialist utopianism, be it right-wing uh, utopianism or, or left-wing utopianism, there is a thirst for blood and there is this idea of overthrowing the elites and killing the elites and getting rid of them and causing enough destabilization in society so that... Um, that destabilization and that chaos can be capitalized upon uh, for the purpose of revolution and replacing and supplanting the current status quo and the current government with something else. Uh, the problem is that <laughs> the people who keep asking for revolution, be they on the left or the right, uh, can't really make up their minds as to what would replace the system if their idealistic revolutions were to ever occur. Um, some people will say, well, we need uh, we need an anarchist government, and then they have to deal with the reality of, well, what happens when you get that stateless society? People will begin to self-organize as they always, always do. People will begin to... Uh, for militias and paramilitaries and they'll start security uh, uh, teams and you know this uh, security becomes the status quo police force and then they have to have militaries because people will fight over territory so it's like okay so you're going to have government anyway right and then who's going to pay for all of that security well you know we're going to have taxes oh okay taxes are back okay so anarchy uh, anarchism is BS and it never will work and it never really has uh, really taken place in any sort of way. Uh, well, it happened in uh, in uh, Catalonia. Oh, let's talk about that, actually. Um, anarchists, socialist anarchists, love to bring up uh, Catalonia, the Catalonian uh, independent state that formed during the Spanish Civil War. Uh, they'll say, well, yeah, it ha actually has succeeded. There was a, a state, uh, the, Cata the, the state of Catalonia in northern Spain actually formed a, a successful anarchist uh, society, and, 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 it, and it was very successful. How long did it last? Oh, uh, o only uh, four years. Okay, so four years really isn't much of an example. I actually took the time to read up on uh, this Catalonian utopia only to find out that it really wasn't a stateless society. It was actually quite totalitarian and quite despotic because the anarchists anarchists, and the socialists, the, the left-wing nationalistic racist fanatics who took over Catalonia began to butcher people by the thousands people that they didn't like ideologically. They murdered people who, for example, uh, had any sort, of, in, in any sort of way, spoke the Latin language because the Latin language is the language of the Catholic Church. So if they heard someone, I don't know, praying in Latin, they were considered an enemy. In fact, there was uh, a young man who they arrested and executed because he, I think they said that he was... Uh, he was caught speaking or praying in Latin or something like that. But it was also because he was uh, involved in the Catholic Church. He was, you know, well, he was an evil fascist who needed to be executed. Actually, no, he was the gardener for the local parish, and they executed him. Uh, thousands of priests were uh, rounded up and executed in this anarchist state, 
anarchist, stateless, stateless state in Catalonia. Nuns were murdered. In fact, there was one nun who was uh, beheaded, and I think they threw her head into a, uh, uh, a, 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 a pig pen to be eaten by the pigs. It was, it was really, really horrific stuff. Uh, mass executions. Thank God for Franco. That's all I have to say, because Franco... Um, took care of that problem. The guy who was running this stateless uh, society in Catalonia was a far-left uh, fanatic by the name of Luis Companis, and he was a uh, uh, far-left lunatic who was a mass murderer. And till this day, to this day, I should say, um, uh, Catalonian nationalists will revere and... Um, adulate this this evil mass murderer but that was the 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 th th this is one of like two examples that anarchists always love to point to they also point to some ukrainian uh free state which was supposedly anarchist but nonetheless it ran just like you know a normal society had a government uh there were leaders you know and and the soviet union ended up destroying it after like i don't know a, a a year or so i'm not entirely sure how long it lasted it didn't last that long if i remember if i remember correctly uh and the soviet union destroyed it so there was there there is no successful um anarchist uh examples out there uh and then you have these fanatics who will say like well we can establish like a uh, an, a, an aristocracy or something like that and, and that'll be much better than the system we have here's the problem with revolutionaries they ignore the reality of power dynamics, and by that I mean the reality of uh, the, the reality that the ones who control the finances are the ones who control society. Why do you think every time um, there's some kind of like rising Republican politician or an established uh, politician, be it Republican or Democrat, you always find out well they're connected to these corporations, they're connected to these CEOs or these big ex executives, they're connected somehow to the wealthy class. They're th by wealthy, I'm not talking about some guy who's got a million in, in the bank account. I mean, like people who are worth billions. Um, all these politicians are somehow connected to venture capitalists, uh, technocrats, uh, th or the, the the technological elites. Uh, even Donald Trump, you know, who wh whose whole campaign uh, strategy was about you know going against the elites and cleaning out the swamp, draining the swamp, and all that stuff. Uh, Trump was connected to. Uh, various elites, uh, one of them be being Peter Thiel, who is uh, a right-wing, um, uh, uh, one of these right-wing, like, cyberpunk type, libertarian fanatics, you know, Austrian school of economics types, and uh, he uh, believes in eugenics, and he actually finances eugenic causes, and he was also a big financer for Trump's political campaign. So no matter what you do, politics and finances are completely inseparable because if you want to rule a country, if you want to rule a society, you have to be in good terms with the, um, with the power structures and those are the ones that control finances. The ones who control the finances are the ones who control the country for the most part. That's why um, you have lobbying and you have lobbyists and um, politicians uh, need their their funders. You know, that's just the reality. So it's like, well, I thought I was going to vote for this guy and he was a libertarian and he was going to, like, you know, change the system, but I find out that he's actually getting paid by, like, some big players in the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, that's how it works. So if you have a revolution, you're going to have a wealthy class no matter what. People are going to make money and you are always going to have the haves and you are always going to have the have nots now that leads me to something else uh jesus talked about this and i love how um liberation theologians and these and these like essentially communists who masquerade as christians like to talk about how well jesus was this socialist and he was a hippie socialist guy and um he um uh, you know he would have uh hated capitalism or something like that and he would have been like smoking weed with the disciples and surfing by the red sea or something like that drinking starbucks or whatever but jesus uh, 
actually hated these types of people. These people who, who are always talking about how, you know, we have to do revolution and give it to, you know, take the land and take the wealth and give it to the poor. Jesus hated these people. How do I know that? Because Judas Iscariot was the very first socialist theologian. Judas, the, uh, the traitor. Remember the story of the woman who goes to Jesus. She's a prostitute. And she goes to Jesus and she takes a bottle of very expensive perfume and she perfumes Jesus's feet. And she and she washes uh, Jesus's feet with her tears. And puts perfume on his feet. And Jesus redeems this woman. Uh, and Jesus sees that she is filled with penance and and forgives her of her sins. Judas Iscariot says, "Why wasn't that bottle?" Uh, sold and the money given to the poor. And Jesus tells Judas, the poor will always be with you. That's basically what I'm saying in all these videos I've been doing against revolution and against all this crazy idealism. Well, we can replace the system with this. We can, you know, take all the property and give it to the poor. We can take all the wealth and redistribute it. It's like, no matter what you do, no matter what you do, that which you want to destroy will always be here. It will always be here until kingdom come. You're always going to have a wealthy class. You're always going to have an elite. You're always going to have people who control the wealth. You're always going to have people who who have lots and lots of the property. You're always going to have people who, who owe debts because they don't have the money to, to purchase land or to purchase home, a home. So they have to go to the bank to get a loan. Like You're always going to have this sort of system. Because it's just the way things are. The poor will always be with you. And what does the gospel say about Judas? The gospel says that the reason why Judas said this wasn't because he really cared about the poor. It's because he was a thief. And all of these far-left socialists, all of these revolutionaries, be they righties or lefties, are thieves. The reason why they want to do a revolution is because they want to steal. They want to steal and to murder. Do you know how I would um, describe these these socialist revolutionaries? I would describe them as serial killers who want to kill people, but they want to do so legally. They're essentially Ted Bundy and Dahmer and Edmund Kemper and Ed Gein. They're all of these guys, and they have murderous fantasies, but they want to carry out their murderous fantasies legally. They want to do so in a way where that they can get away with, they can get away with murder and thievery. So they want to take all the land. They want to kill the people who own the land, and they want to redistribute it. They want to steal it, and they keep complaining about the elites, the elites. And, and I'm not talking about just libs. I'm not talking about lefties, just lefties. I'm talking about also righties. The righties have a lot of these types of people as well. You got the Boogaloo Boys, and you got these. Um, I really want to say like these Tim Pool type uh, liberals. They're, they basically have liberal morals or left wing morals, but they will support a, a right wing regimes or they will support some aspects of right wing ideology. But it's really a mix. It's a mix. It's like the Nazis. You know, the Nazis, they had a mixture of right wing and left wing beliefs. They had socialism. They also had, if you look at a lot of Nazi rhetoric, there, they had rhetoric that was very close to the Leninists, and they took things from Marxism, they mixed it up with nationalism, and that's what you have. The Catalonian nationalists have a similar thing going on, where they're very left-wing politically, they have socialist ideas, but they can be extremely racist against those who don't speak Catalonian, and they can be extremely racist against people who speak Spanish, because they want to separate from Spain, so they hate Spanish speakers. It's why um, one of the big Catalonian politicians, Kim Torra, he described Spanish speakers as being lower than beasts. So definite racism there. But these people are thieves. They're thieves, they're murderers, and they just want to kill and steal. It's like what Jesus warned about in the, um, in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10. I remember this because it's a verse that I have referenced many times. Jesus said... Um, Whoever tells you that there is another way to salvation is a murderer and a thief. And that's what these people are. They want you to hate the church, to hate God, 
and they want you to join their cult, their personality cult, their cult of personality, and their murderers and their thieves. Bottom line. Bottom freaking line. Okay, I want to show you guys some examples of what I'm talking about here. Let's go to history. Let's get a little bit into history here. French Revolution and the Bolshevik Revolution. Both great examples of what I'm talking about here. So there, there are some excerpts from a historian named Christopher Hibbert who has written a lot on the French Revolution. I want to read to you guys some stuff from him. So he talks about the barbarity of the French Revolution and how absolutely gory and bloody and, and sadistic and evil it was. And he says, he, he puts a quote from a, a, a famous French uh, rebel by the name of Saint Just. Just is J U S T. French people have last names like this, like Saint Bernard, Saint this, Saint that, even though they're like complete atheists, they have these types of last names. Uh, so there's a quote from this rebel in which he says, quote, you have no more grounds for restraint against the enemies of the new order, and liberty must prevail at any price. We must rule by iron those who cannot be ruled by justice. You must punish not merely traitors, but the indifferent as well. So those who are, those who are indifferent to our cause have to be executed. And yet in the same sentence, he says liberty must prevail. See, this is why I'm always wary of those who talk about like, well, we have to have freedom and liberty. And it's all just liberty and freedom and, 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 and individual rights and this and that. Like a lot of these people, I'm telling you, I have to question their motives. It's like, well, what do you mean by absolute freedom? What do you mean by absolute liberty? We have to like overthrow the society and replace it with like a, a society just based on freedom, no control, no government regulation, no government control. It's like, well, how the hell are you going to run society? And, and one thing that I've that I suspect when it comes to these people is that these people are extremists. So when they are not in power, they have this very extreme view of absolute freedom. And overthrowing the system. Overthrowing the system. And once they get power, that extreme mentality is still there, but now it's being channeled with this with this this lust for power and it's insatiable and they just go crazy and they just start killing people and they become worse than the system that they overthrew. Uh, there was a very violent rebel, he was a Jacobin and Jacobins were fanatics. His name was Brichet, Brichet, B-R-I-C-H-E-T. It says here that Brichet advised that the law of suspects should be interpreted so that all the well-to-do came with its scope. Questions should be asked in every village about the means of the principal farmer. If he were rich, he should be guillotined without further ado. He was bound to be a food hoarder. But if but it was not only the rich, or even mainly the rich, who suffered. The poor were executed with the well-to-do, women with men, the young with the old, some accused of starving the poor, others of, depri of depraving public morals, one witness for not giving his testimony properly. And ma amazingly, people today will say, well, the French Revolution was great because, well, it got rid of the power of the church, yet it replaced the power of the church with a, with a new moral institution, and that was the institution of the Enlightenment, and it was... Um, more brutal than whatever it was that they were trying to remove or that they did remove. Um, now, this idea of killing someone because they're rich, this was practiced wholeheartedly during the Bolshevik Revolution. And I want to read to you guys uh, about uh, a little bit about that. So there's a quote here from a Bolshevik um, leader and I'm going to try to dig it up here. Okay, so there was um, there was a guy, his name was Martin Latsis. Martin Latsis was an official of the Cheka. The Cheka was Vladimir Lenin's secret police. And this is a quote from from 1918 from the 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 um, from this official of the secret police. He says, quote, we are not waging war against individuals. We are exterminating the bourgeoisie as a class. Do not look for evidence that the accused acted in word or deed against Soviet power. The first question should be, to what class does he belong? It is this that he should determine. It is this that should determine his fate. So no trial, no investigation, no due process, nothing. Once you were found to be of the higher class or the, the bourgeoisie, 
execution. The French Revolution had the same sort of fanaticism. Now let's talk a little bit about the barbarity of the French Revolution, just to give you guys an idea. So this is also from the same historian, Mr. Hibbert. The worst excesses were committed in the provinces where, although most rep uh, most represents in a mission, representatives of the government, were more concerned with enlisting recruits and collecting supplies than with punishment. In several towns, the guillotine was kept constantly at work, and those convicted of crimes against the revolution were slaughtered wholesale on the instructions of fanatical or savage representatives or of those who were frightened of being considered too weak. So, oh, this person, I, I don't want to be seen as weak, so I'm going to kill as many people as possible to show that I'm a strong acolyte of the revolution, strong representative of the Enlightenment. Uh, at Lyons, the government's representatives decided that the guillotine was too slow an instrument for their purpose and had over 300 of their victims mown down by cannon fire. What a delicious moment, reported an approving witness to a friend in Paris. How you should have enjoyed it. What a sight. Worthy indeed of liberty. Wish bonjour to Robespierre. These people were absolute lunatics. From Fierres, the, representatives him, the representative himself reported, The butchery has been good. At Nantes, 3,000 captives perished in an epidemic in the grossly overcrowded prisons, and a further 2,000 were towed out in barges to the middle of the Loire and drowned. So basically, people were put into ships by the thousands, and the ships were sunk, and people were drowned to their deaths. The river became so choked with these barges that ships weighing anchor brought them up filled with the dead. Birds of prey hovered over the waters, gorging themselves with human flesh, and the fish became so contaminated that orders had to be given forbidding them to be caught. On occasion, Carrier, another rebel, appeared to be insane as raving endlessly about the need to kill and kill and to butcher children without hesitation. He slashed at the air with his sword. This is like uh, Rwandan genocide level fanaticism. Jean-Baptiste Carrier, the government's representative overseeing the terror in Nantes, took particular care to drown, to drown priests and nuns and called the Loire the national bathtub. There's so much of this. A woman was charged with the heinous crime of having wept at the execution of her husband. She was consequently condemned to sit several hours under the suspended blade which shed upon her. Drop by drop, the blood of the deceased whose corpse was above her on the scaffold before she was released by death from her agony. So she was placed underneath the guillotine and she was forced to sit as blood dripped on her and then they murdered her. The time was come which was foretold, as Madame Roland had said, when the people would ask for bread and be given corpses. Men were reported by reliable witnesses to have been drinking, eating, and smoking amidst the carnage, using for tables and chairs the naked bodies of their victims whose clothes had been removed as one of the recognized prerequisites of the assassins. They were out of breath, one observer reported, and they asked for wine to drink. Wine or death? The civilian commissioner of the section gave them vouchers for 24 pints addressed to a neighboring wine merchant. They su these they soon drank and contemplated with drunken satisfaction the corpses scattered in the court. Do you want to see the heart of an aristocrat? asked one assassin. Opening up a corpse, tearing out the heart, squeezing some blood into a glass, drinking part, and offering the rest to those who would drink with him. Drink this if you want to save your father's life, commanded another, handing a pot of aristocrat's blood to the daughter of a former governor of the Invalides. She put it to her lips so that her father would be spared. Women were said to have drawn up benches to watch the murders in comfort and to have cheered and clapped as at a cockfight, just like the gladiatorial games in the Colosseum. Europe returned to paganism during the French Revolution. And I believe, really, because you can sit here and say, well, Ted, that was hundreds of years ago. Who cares? I don't think we ever really recovered from the French Revolution, especially Europe, because Europe is still very paganistic, contrary to Christianity, and still has a very strong appreciation for rebelliousness. 
and the status quo in Europe could be overturned in a year, really. And I'll talk about that in a upcoming video. But this was the, the French Revolution. The, Bolshe the Bolshevik Revolution was also horrific. People who were, you know, considered, oh, landowners and people who owned land and the wealthy, they were butchered. The, the, the Cossacks were, were butchered. They wanted to exterminate the Kulaks. It was really class genocide. And I want to read to you guys uh, some examples of the Lebanese Civil War. Because the Lebanese Civil War was also uh, a bunch of ideological factions who wanted to establish their own societies. Just to give you guys um, a taste of how horrific these sorts of situations are. There was a, in the 1980s, there was a horrific conflict between the Maronites, who were, who are the Catholics of Lebanon, and the Druze. And the Druze are a, 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 a religious group of people. They essentially mixed uh, Islam with Judaism, and they mixed in some Buddhism, I want to say, and they are their own ethnic and religious group. And the Maronites and the Druze have never liked each other. They had a horrific war back in the year 1860. Thousands and thousands of people were butchered, both soldiers and civilians, mainly Christians. And they began killing each other again in the 1980s. And a lot of this had to do with the fact that Israel got involved in Lebanon and Israel began to arm the Maronites. And it just escalated into... A, a, a horrific escalation. Um, it escalated into <laughs> bloodshed between different uh, two different groups, the Maronites and the Druze. And so I want to read to you guys some things here. This is from a book that I've been reading. It's called Pity the Nation. It's a very long book. It's almost uh, 700 pages long. It says here that near Deir al Kamar, scarcely 600 yards from an Israeli checkpoint, Christian gunmen kidnapped Druze motorists from their cars. They selected 15 young men, separated them from their wives and children, and forced them to walk to an old bridge over a rocky gorge. There, one by one, the 15 were marched to the center of the bridge where a man systematically plunged a two foot butcher's knife into their hearts. Each corpse was thrown over the bridge onto the rocks. The knife just missed one man's heart and his fall from the bridge was cushioned by the corpses of his co-religionists. He thus survived to tell the tale. Perhaps as a result, bodies were later found with their tongues cut out. The Druze dispatched Christian captives with equal savagery, sometimes after pouring boiling water over their, over their naked bodies in an underground torture chamber at Beit Edin. When Tatro and I try... Okay, etc. So he goes, on, he goes off into... Um, something else here. Well, he just goes off into different details that would take too long to explain. Um, and then it says here, several days later, a Druze neighbor of ours, an intelligent, pretty woman who worked as a midwife for Christians and Muslims in Beirut, tried to drive up the same road. She was stopped by gunmen and gang raped. They cut her throat and threw her body down a well. Since the beginning of the year, well over a thousand men and women had been kidnapped and murdered in the Shuf, the Shuf Mountains, is where the fighting between the Druze and the um, and the Christians uh, were taking place. So that's the reality, guys. It's nothing pretty. All this talk about overthrowing the elites and revolution and civil war and, well, you know, we have to, you know. Take down the system. Get rid of the system. All this talk is is just um, it's fantasy, and none of us really want to be in uh, the fantasy of madmen because then, well, we would be living in a nightmare. Anyway, you guys just heard some theology. God bless. <laughs>